This audio lecture is based entirely upon the case books Liberty, Equality, and Due Process, Cases, Controversies, and Contexts in Constitutional Law, and First Amendment, Cases, Controversies, and Contexts by Ruth Ann Robson. The case books are published by Cali E. Langdell Press and licensed Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike 4.0. That means that the author has allowed everyone to copy and redistribute the material in any medium or format and remix, transform, and build upon the material as long as users give appropriate credit. Don't use the material for commercial purposes and redistribute contributions under the same license. Much thanks is due to Ruthann for writing these books and providing them to everyone for free. In furtherance of this spirit and in compliance with the original license, I also license this audio lecture as Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike 4.0. I hope you enjoy. Hello. Welcome to Section 5 of the United States Constitution Lectures. In this section, we'll talk about non-racial classifications and equal protection. Rational basis standard as default. The lowest tier of equal protection judicial review is generally referred to as rational basis review. Under this standard, the government interest need only be legitimate and the means chosen reasonably or rationally related to that interest. Gender classifications. In Bradwell v. Illinois in 1873, the issue before the court was whether Illinois' denial of a license to practice law to Mrs. Myra Bradwell, because she was a married woman, violated the 14th Amendment. Rather than equal protection, the case rested on the Privileges or Immunities Clause, and the court relied on the slaughterhouse cases decided the day before. To hold that practicing law was not one of the privileges or immunities protected by the 14th Amendment, or by the Privileges and Immunities Clause of Article 4. In Minor v. Happer set in 1874, the issue was the constitutionality of a Missouri statute that provided every male citizen of the United States shall be entitled to vote. The case arose when Mrs. Virginia Minor tried to register to vote but was refused because she was not a male citizen of the United States, but a woman. The court declared that, quote, There is no doubt that women may be citizens. They are persons, and by the 14th Amendment, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are expressly declared to be citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. But, in our opinion, it did not need this amendment to give them that position. Before its adoption, the Constitution of the United States did not, in terms, prescribe who should be citizens of the United States or of the several states. Yet there were necessarily such citizens without such provision. There cannot be a nation without a people. The very idea of a political community, such as a nation is, implies an association of persons for the promotion of their general welfare. End quote. Note that the court stated that this citizenship flows from the 14th Amendment's first sentence, which reversed Dred Scott, and that this citizenship predates the 14th Amendment. Amendment, presumably limited to women who were not enslaved. 
The court, however, unanimously held that suffrage, or the right to vote, was not within the 14th Amendment's protection, specifically privileges or immunities. In support, the court pointed to the 15th Amendment, which provides the rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. If the 14th Amendment included the right to vote, the court reasoned there would have been no need for the 15th Amendment. The court concluded, quote, We have given this case the careful consideration its importance demands. If the law is wrong, it ought to be changed. But the power for that is not with us. The arguments addressed to us, bearing upon such a view of the subject, may perhaps be sufficient to induce those having the power to make the alteration but they ought not to be permitted to influence our judgment in determining the present rights of the parties now litigating before us. No argument as to women's need of suffrage can be considered. We can only act upon her rights as they exist. It is not for us to look at the hardship of withholding. Our duty is at an end if we find it is within the power of a state to withhold. The 19th Amendment providing for women's suffrage was introduced in Congress a few years after Minor. It was submitted to the states for ratification in 1919 and adopted in 1920, 46 years after Minor. Intermediate Scrutiny the Supreme Court created the Intermediate Scrutiny Test in Craig v. Boren in 1976. In Craig, the court applied the test to a statute which discriminated on the basis of gender, which is a protected class. Gender and Difference While one could consider the gender cases litigated under the Equal Protection Clause as flowing from feminism, similar to the manner in which the race and ethnicity case flowed from the civil rights movement. There were several strands of feminism, and feminists did not always agree on which cases should be litigated and what the outcome of those cases should be. In part, this was because there were laws that were deemed protective towards women, as Justice Brennan noted in Frontiero. Quote, An attitude of romantic paternalism, which, in practical effect, put women not on a pedestal, but in a cage. But feminists were also divided on the meanings of equality, sex, gender, difference, and the role of law. Further, feminists were divided among lines of class, race, ethnicity, as well as politics. This produced a complex theoretical environment, but the theoretical perspectives can be simplified into three major approaches. Liberal feminism, sometimes called formal equality, advocates that the law should treat men and women equally. Under this view, even a law that advantages or accommodates women should be subject to the same rigor, resulting in unconstitutionality. Cultural feminism advocates that the law should recognize biological differences between men and women, and, more controversially, should also recognize sociobiological differences between men and women. Under this view, a law that distinguishes between women and men might be subject to the same rigor, but might be constitutional. Radical feminism, sometimes called dominance feminism, advocates that the law should recognize 
and work towards eliminating the subordination of women to men. And further, that the law should question maleness as the default neutral standard. Under this view, a law that subordinates women should be unconstitutional. A law that works towards ending that subordination should be constitutional. Sometimes these three theoretical approaches all lead to the same result. Other times, especially when the underlying issues involve reproductive capabilities or the effective qualities arguably rooted in reproductive capabilities. For example, women are more nurturing. Or sex or sexual violence, violence against women. The perspectives, which would not necessarily be advocated by feminists, support conflicting approaches and outcomes. Two controversial cases are illustrative. In Geldedig v. Aiello in 1974, the court considered an equal protection clause challenge to a provision in the California Unemployment Compensation Disability Program that excluded pregnancy and pregnancy-related conditions from coverage. The court held the California program constitutional. In footnote 20, the court explained, quote, The dissenting opinion to the contrary. This case is thus a far cry from cases like Reed v. Reed and Frontiero v. Richardson, involving discrimination based upon gender as such. The California insurance program does not exclude anyone from benefit eligibility because of gender, but merely removes one physical condition, pregnancy, from the list of compensable disabilities. While it is true that only women can become pregnant, it does not follow that every legislative classification concerning pregnancy is a sex-based classification like those considered in Reed and Frontiero. Normal pregnancy is an objectively identifiable physical condition with unique characteristics. Absent as showing that distinctions involving pregnancy are mere pretexts designed to affect an invidious discrimination against the members of one sex or another, lawmakers are constitutionally free to include or exclude pregnancy from the coverage of legislation such as this on any reasonable basis, just as with respect to any other physical condition. The lack of identity between the excluded disability and gender, as such, under this insurance program, becomes clear upon the most cursory analysis. The program divides potential recipients into two groups, pregnant women and non-pregnant persons. While the first group is exclusively female, the second includes members of both sexes. The fiscal and actuarial benefits of the program thus accrue to members of both sexes. End quote. Other classifications. In Sessions v. Morales Santana, there is also an issue of illegitimacy or non marital children, the status of being born to an unmarried woman. At times, such classifications can also be gender classifications, as in Morales-Santana, because the classification also involves treating unmarried mothers differently than unmarried fathers with regard to the child. Indeed, there is a constellation of cases, often known as the unmarried father cases, which involve parental rights and obligations of fathers. For example, in Lair v. Robertson in 1983, the court held that an unmarried biological father who did not acknowledge the child was not denied equal protection or due process when the mother's subsequent husband adopted the child. Other cases involve a claim by an illegitimate child more directly. 
For example, in Levy v. Louisiana in 1968, the court, in a very brief opinion, held unconstitutional the exclusion of illegitimate children from the right to bring an action for their mother's wrongful death. The state courts had interpreted child in the wrongful death statute to mean legitimate child, and the denial to illegitimate children of the right to recover justified as based on morals and general welfare because it discourages bringing children into the world out of wedlock. Justice Douglas wrote for the court, first emphasized that illegitimate children are persons within the Equal Protection Clause, then wrote, quote, Why should the illegitimate child be denied rights merely because of his birth out of wedlock? He is certainly subject to all the responsibilities of a citizen, including the payment of taxes and conscription under the Selective Service Act. How, under our constitutional regime, can he be denied correlative rights which other citizens enjoy? Legitimacy or illegitimacy of birth has no relation to the nature of the wrong allegedly inflicted on the mother. These children, though illegitimate, were dependent on her. She cared for them and nurtured them. They were indeed hers in the biological and the spiritual sense. In her death, they suffered wrong in the sense that any dependent would. We conclude that it is invidious to discriminate against them when no action, conduct, or demeanor of theirs is possibly relevant to the harm that was done the mother. End quote. In Clark v. Jeter in 1988, an opinion by Justice O'Connor, the court explicitly stated that classifications based on illegitimacy generally merit intermediate scrutiny. The court writing, quote, In considering whether state legislation violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, we apply different levels of scrutiny to different types of classifications. At a minimum, a statutory classification must be rationally related to a legitimate governmental purpose. Classifications based on race or national origin and classifications affecting fundamental rights are given the most exacting scrutiny. Between these extremes of rational basis review and strict scrutiny lies a level of intermediate scrutiny, which generally has been applied to discriminatory classifications based on sex or illegitimacy. To withstand intermediate scrutiny, a statutory classification must be substantially related to an important governmental objective. Consequently, we have invalidated classifications that burden illegitimate children for the sake of punishing the illicit relations of their parents, because visiting this condemnation on the head of an infant is illogical and unjust. Age Generally, the court has decided that age classifications merit only rational basis review. Regarding younger people, the court in City of Dallas v. Stanglin in 1989 applied rational basis review to uphold the constitutionality of an ordinance that licensed a class of dance halls that restricted admission to persons between the ages of 14 and 18 and limited their hours of operation. Without much analysis, the opinion by Chief Justice Rehnquist for the court assumed that teenagers were not a suspect class. The major issue was whether there was a First Amendment right of association. Protecting the 14 to 18-year-olds from the corrupting influences of older teenagers and young adults was a legitimate interest, and the means chosen was sufficiently rational. 
As to older people, the court in Massachusetts Board of Retirement versus Mergia in 1976 upheld a mandatory retirement age of 50 for police officers. In its per curiam opinion, considering what level of scrutiny should apply, the court stated, quote, nor does the class of uniformed state police officers over 50 constitute a suspect class for purposes of equal protection analysis. The court has observed that a suspect class is one saddled with such disabilities or subjected to such a history of purposeful unequal treatment or relegated to such a position of political powerlessness as to command extraordinary protection from the majoritarian political process. While the treatment of the aged in this nation has not been wholly free of discrimination, such persons, unlike, say, those who have been discriminated against on the basis of race or national origin, have not experienced a history of purposeful unequal treatment or been subjected to unique disabilities on the basis of stereotyped characteristics not truly indicative of their abilities. The class subject to the compulsory retirement feature of the Massachusetts statute consists of uniformed state police officers over the age of 50. It cannot be said to discriminate only against the elderly. Rather, it draws a line at a certain age in middle life. But even old age does not define a discreet and insular group in need of extraordinary protections from the majoritarian political process. Instead, it marks a stage that each of us will reach if we live out our normal span. Even if the statute could be said to impose a penalty upon a class defined as the aged, it would not impose a distinction sufficiently akin to those classifications that we have found suspect to call for strict judicial scrutiny. Under the circumstances, it is unnecessary to subject the state's resolution of competing interests in this case to the degree of critical examination that our cases under the Equal Protection Clause recently have characterized as strict judicial scrutiny. End quote. Applying rational basis, the court found that the statute clearly meets the standard. The court articulated the government interest as seeking to protect the public by assuring physical preparedness of its uniformed police. It found that the mandatory retirement at 50 serves to remove from police service those whose fitness or uniform work presumptively has diminished with age. The court acknowledged that individualized testing might be a better method, but that did not mean it was irrational. The court added, quote, We do not make light of the substantial economic and psychological effects premature and compulsory retirement can have on an individual, nor do we denigrate the ability of elderly citizens to continue to contribute to society. The problems of retirement have been well documented and are beyond serious dispute. Language Hernandez v. New York implicitly rejects the argument that Spanish speakers constitute a racial or national origin classification and implicitly rejects the argument that Spanish speakers would be a group that would merit other than rational basis scrutiny. In an earlier case, Hernandez v. Texas, in 1974, the court held that the systematic exclusion of Mexicans from the juror pool violated the Equal Protection Clause. Although 14% of the county population were persons with Mexican or Latin American surnames, the state stipulated that For the last 25 years, there is no record of any person with a Mexican or Latin American name having served on a jury commission, grand jury, or petite jury in Jackson County. 
writing for the court, Chief Justice Warren relied on Strouder v. West Virginia in 1880 and stated, quote, Throughout our history, differences in race and color have defined easily identifiable groups which have, at times, required the aid of the courts in securing equal treatment under the laws. But community prejudices are not static, and from time to time, other differences from the community norm may define other groups which need the same protection. Whether such a group exists within a community is a question of fact. When the existence of a distinct class is demonstrated, and it is further shown that the laws, as written or as applied, single out that class for different treatment not based on some reasonable classification, the guarantees of the Constitution have been violated. The petitioner's initial burden in substantiating his charge of group discrimination was to prove that persons of Mexican descent constitute a separate class in Jackson County, distinct from whites. One method by which this may be demonstrated is by showing the attitude of the community. Here the testimony of responsible officials and citizens contained the admission that residents of the community distinguished between white and Mexican. The participation of persons of Mexican descent in business and community groups was shown to be slight. Until very recent times, children of Mexican descent were required to attend a segregated school for the first four grades. No substantial evidence was offered to rebut the logical inference to be drawn from these facts, and it must be concluded that petitioners succeeded in his proof. End quote. This is all I'd like to discuss in this section. Thanks, everybody, and take care.